first we want to uh, let's get familiar with the Adobe Connect tools as we're going through this. Uh, during, the during the presentation, we will have folks muted. This is to avoid any sound and, and anything in the, in the background noise. Um, if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, we are going to ask folks to type those questions and comments into the chat box located here at the bottom right. As you can see, folks have already started to type in right there. Um, and go on to the next slide. Uh, to, get, to test some of that, to make you familiar with the platform, let's, uh, we'd like to find out how you're participating today. On the top right, right here, you'll see a little person. And you can select hand raised or agree. We're asking folks that if you are joining us with your team in a conference room or together as a group, to please raise your hand. And if you're joining us individually, we ask that you select the little checkbox check right there. Um, we, are, we have a little platform on the side with the attending. So we can see folks that are checking off. Um, so we can see when you guys are raising your hands if you have any questions or the sort. Um, we're also, let's go ahead and test the chat box as well. If you're joining us a group, as a group, go ahead and enter the number of people that are with you and your team and list uh, maybe your county or your jurisdiction from which you are joining us from. If you're joining us on the call individually, um, we'd like for you to type in your name, your first and your last name in the chat box, just so that we know that you're, that you're able to use the platform here. Great, we got folks from Grand Traverse joining us. We have a couple, a lot of folks attending on their own and some folks in the groups. Great. Thank you for joining us today. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, for today's webinar, we'd li also like to find out one thing that you'd like to learn about today's uh, training so we can help address some of those. Uh, go ahead and type in on the chat box um, if, as you get in a chance to, to write some of those things that you, are will, that you would like to learn today on the, on the webinar. All right, we've got folks typing in some, some of their learning objectives here. Well, we're, Jessica Pierce, our presenter, will surely address some of those. Hopefully, I'll be able to address some of those. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk some about how the juvenile drug court works. And we're not going to get into some really specifics about it, um, but we're going to talk in a general way. Uh, but we're always available to offer more specifics. Definitely going to talk about appropriate candidate selection um, and kind of the overview of what the juvenile drug court's all about. How long should juveniles be in the drug court? That's an interesting question that I'm not really planning to answer today. Uh, I think it varies. Um, I can tell you that the average uh, length of time that kids spend in a juvenile drug court um, is somewhere between 9 and 18 months. Um, what I always tell folks is to think about their terms of probation and how that matches up. Um, with the kids that can come in. Legality of testing juveniles. Um, Erica, you need to, to call us and we'll have a, have a more conversation about that. Um, there has been no challenges to the legality, but uh, it sounds like you might have some specific questions. All right. Um, as other folks chime in with other things they want to learn about, we can address those. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us again and for typing in your comments and letting us know who's joining us today in that chat box there. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to present uh, Jessica Pierce. She will be doing the presentation on today's webinar. Um, let's get started. Jessica? OK, great. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Pierce. I work for the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and we are your hosts today um, for this webinar. 
uh, our webinar is actually funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and uh, they always like us to make this disclaimer that the points of view expressed are those of the presenter and do not uh, represent the official positions or policies of the office. So um, just so everyone is aware of that. Um, we at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges have been providing training and technical assistance to juvenile drug courts around the country um, off and on since 1998. So what we've been able to do is really watch how juvenile drug courts have evolved over time. And uh, one of the things that we've found is that, um, that conceptually, uh, folks that work in juvenile drug courts really understand the concepts behind them. Um, but a lot of times it's the, the practical tools and how you actually kind of put some of those concepts into practice that folks struggle with. And so that's become our charge as your training and technical assistance providers, is how to help you really figure out how to be practical and how to, how to work with the, the youth and families uh, in your community who have concurrent substance abuse and delinquency. This is a challenging population. Most juvenile drug courts are targeting kids that have had repeated episodes of both delinquency and substance use and are uh, kind of the frequent flyers of the system, which means that they have, they have, they have stuff going on in their lives that you're going to have to try to figure out how to help them address. Um, it's, it's not an easy job to work in a juvenile drug court. Um, I always say that, uh, you know, I uh, do this work, and I, I've been actually with the project since we started in 1998. Um, I always say that I do this work because it's important and that I believe that what you do makes a difference and, and that you can help change the trajectory of somebody's life, and that's really important. Um, and so my job is, is to support you in doing that. Uh, we have a number of ways that we do that here at the National Council. Um, so we have uh, the Juvenile Drug Courts uh, Training and Technical Assistance Project. And really within that, we have uh, a number of areas of focus. And uh, the first thing that we do is we have a project advisory committee. Um, just like you all work as a team, on the national level, we also work as a team because it's really important for all of the same folks that are coming to your table to be represented at the national level as well. So we do work with a number of national partners. So everything that you're hearing today um, kind of uh, is, is the official position sort of, of of what a juvenile drug court should be like and should operate like. Uh, we provide training um, across the, the country. Uh, we come to a lot of state drug court conferences, um, but we also provide local training as well. Um, the good news for all of you is that you can think of us as walking dollar signs because our money is supposed to be spent to help you. Um, and so that means that if you're wondering um, about drug testing and you want to have a training in your jurisdiction on drug testing, you can call me and say, Jessica, I need a training on drug testing for my jurisdiction and I can send somebody out to you or we can set up a webinar just like this and we can get you drug testing training. So that's my job. That's what our dollars are supposed to be spent for. I can't help you hire new staff, and I can't help you buy incentives, but anything that you have a question about that's related to drug courts, I can help you get training on. Um, and it can, be, it can be broad. When I talk about related to drug courts, if you're interested in motivational interviewing for your team, I can pay for that. If you're interested in learning more about trauma, I can pay for that. So think broadly about how you might want to have assistance for your court as you move forward. We are available to provide this um, assistance up through 2018 at the moment. So that's how long our funding is. And so this is a really important thing that you know that we're here as a resource for you and you should think about calling on us. Um, the other thing we provide is technical assistance. And this is where we actually come out to your court, we watch you in practice, we watch you do staffing, we watch you do court, and then we offer suggestions and we offer training just to your little jurisdiction, just to your team, about kind of how you can improve your practice. Um, it's pretty intensive, uh, but I think it really can help you uh, change how you behave and how you practice. Uh, the um, fourth thing that we do are demonstration sites. And this is pretty new for us. Um, we, uh, on the drug court site, have not had demonstration sites, although the National Council is kind of famed for our demonstration sites. Uh, but two years ago, we, we added in what we call our learning collaborative. And the learning collaborative takes uh, courts from across the country, and we ask them to kind of experiment with us and let us observe them in practice 
and uh, watch and see how they operate. And then we ask them to actually make changes to their practice based on what we think is, is a good idea, what we think is best practice. Juvenile drug courts don't have quite the wealth of research that adult courts have. So we are trying to do two different things. Um, on the national level, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention is building research-based models that courts can use. On our level, we're building practice-based models that courts can use. And so research and practice come together then to provide you with the best information. So what that means is that my demonstration sites um, try things for us. So one of the things that we've been thinking about uh, is that kids in drug courts um, sometimes have a hard time meeting our expectations. And that the phase structure, which we just kind of copied right from adult drug courts, might not work for kids as well as it works for adults. And so we have some courts that are trying point-level reward systems instead, which means that to move through the phase, kids earn points for behaviors that we want them to do, like going to school and going to court and going to treatment. And then when they earn a sufficient number of points, assuming they've met other criteria like sobriety, then they're allowed to use those points to move to the next phase. This makes it very clear to the young people what is required of them, and it puts them in the driver's seat. So we like that. So we've had these 12 courts trying out kind of what a point level reward system looks like. And we've watched and we've watched their practice. And then we've measured kind of some outcomes, um, not necessarily for youth. We're talking about program outcomes. But with they're having better graduations. Kids are spending um, fewer days in a phase, um, all of those kinds of things. So those were the outcomes we were looking for. Uh, we will be adding six new demonstration sites coming this spring. So uh, all of you are eligible to participate with us uh, if you think you your court might make a good candidate to be a guinea pig um, and you want to change your practice. Uh, it, you do get a lot of technical assistance. You'll see folks from the National Council and from our partnering organizations um, frequently throughout the process. Uh, and we will give you lots of support as you do this. Um, the demonstration site application, the Learning Collaborative application, will be out in March. So I, I would suggest everybody keep an eye out for that and think about joining us um, as we build some, some practice-based research. And then the last thing that we do is we try to create resources and tools for all of you. Um, so you can see up um, in the top right-hand corner of your screen, we have something that says File 3. And these are actually files you can download from today's meeting. The first one is the 16 strategies, which is uh, the, the strategic underpinning of the juvenile drug court. Uh, and that was developed in 2003, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but what we found is that the 16 strategies weren't enough for folks to operationalize. So we've created a lot of other resources as well. And one of the, the best ones that we have um, are the tip sheets, which is the next file in the list. So I would suggest that you download both of those. And then the third file there is this PowerPoint. So you can download that as well. All right, so today we are going to talk about the key elements of the juvenile drug court. We're going to describe how a juvenile drug court can improve responses to and outcomes for court-involved youth. And uh, we're going to identify the appropriate target population for, for the juvenile drug court. And you'll see on my slides that I abbreviate juvenile drug court as JDC. And that's what I mean when I say that. All right, so let's find out who's in the audience. Um, we do have uh, about 50 people joining us today. So that's um, an exciting thing for us uh, here at the National Council. We do want to know um, how you would describe yourself. So uh, Ella has a poll she's going to pull up. And uh, we just want you to let us know who's in the audience. Right. Oh, we have some judges with us, coordinators, lots of folks uh, who are probation or caseworkers, um, attorneys. Wow, it's it's. We have a full team here. We we could do some staffing and and run a court if we had some kids. Uh, so that's great to see. This is a a nice group um, to be here with us today, and we appreciate um, all of you taking the time for the webinar. All right, we have another poll now. where we want to know about how long you've been working with your, your juvenile drug court. 
So click the box that best describes your experience. No knowledge. You've visited one. You currently work in adult or dependency drug court. A uh, team member of more than a year or less than a year. And so most of you are folks working in courts. Um, some of you are working in adult um, and juvenile um, or uh, making that transition. Um, and it looks like we have uh, a pretty good base of, of folks that have been on their team for a long time or at least more than a year and some that have been on for, for less than that. So thank you all for voting in the poll. All right, so let's talk about it. What is the difference between an adult drug court and a juvenile drug court? And I have lots of ideas about this, but I want to know what you guys know because, I, you know, when you talk to to adults, you guys know a lot of stuff. So I want to I want to get your impression of the difference between adult and juvenile drug courts. And Ello is going to actually, you're going to write your answers in chat, and then we're going to put them up here on the the slide as well. Parental involvement, absolutely. That's one of the the biggest challenges for us when we talk about. Um, juvenile drug courts is the parents and, and, you know, should it be that it's a family drug court where we're dealing with parents and kids and it's certainly more challenging? Kids are not addicts, exactly. So the use that kids have um, is not the same level of use that adults have and you don't have the same kind of um, levers that kids have. Kids don't have a rock bottom yet, so you don't have the same kind of approach that you'd use with adults. And of course, academics, yes, we've got kids that are in school, um, and, and we want them to be in school, we want them to do well there. Age, yes, and also brain development. Those are two things that uh, really affect how kids make decisions, and if we don't take that into account, then we, we um, can have interventions that just aren't appropriate and don't work. Yeah, kids can't change persons, places, and things, exactly. So they don't have control over many of the things that uh, we can ask adults to, to control including their brains. So kids, we know their decision making is not the same as adult decision making. They, um, they don't have uh, the, the same executive functioning. And so sometimes they make decisions uh, for bad reasons. Um, I won't say that kids aren't rational decision makers because sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Uh, so we want to focus on rehabilitation. Kids are impulsive, absolutely. Um, limited resources, yeah. All of our juvenile programs have way less money than uh, their adult counterparts. And of course, when we think about how much money we spend on jail versus treatment, um, it can make a person kind of feel really frustrated. Um, yes, juveniles have more resources available and additional needs. Not sanctioning for positive UAs. Mm, yes, that's hard to, to figure out how to balance um, sanctioning and uh, behavior change focus on rehabilitation rather than incarceration. So you guys have basically done the entire presentation just now answering this question. Um, and you want to have more options for sanctions. Yeah, uh, with adults we know that sending them to jail for like a day or two can be a really effective way to get their attention. That flash incarceration is getting some really good reviews on the adult side. I've got to tell you though, for kids, we don't want to do that, right? All of our research that talks about kids and detention indicates that kids that go to detention have worse outcomes. So it's, it's incumbent on us to think about how to avoid using detention because it is not effective with youth and it doesn't help change behavior. Um, that's not the webinar we're talking about today. We do have an entire webinar about approaches um, that we're going to be doing in February called the three-prong approach. So I would encourage everyone to come back for that. Um, but that's, that's not something we're talking about in depth today. So yeah, there are lots of differences about um, juvenile and adult courts and how you work with kids. Um, and you guys have hit on all of them that I would have put up on the slides. So well done. Uh, we currently have more than 400 juvenile drug courts operating around the country. The exact number varies depending on the year. Um, there are always courts that are closing and always courts that are opening. So um, I, I, I like to say right around 400 um, 
I think the highest we've ever been is about 480, and the lowest over the last 10 years or so is about uh, 420. So they um, and they operate in territories. We have a drug court in Guam. We have a drug court in Puerto Rico. So it is something that is here to stay. Juvenile drug courts are here to stay. Uh, there is an, an enormous amount of congressional support for juvenile and adult drug courts. Um, so there is funding, and that's why I have money to help all of you. Uh, because adult drug courts are so popular, we don't expect that juvenile drug courts are going to go away, even though we don't have the basis of research. And some of our findings have been pretty mixed. I'm, I think um, it's important for all of us to, to recognize that uh, the research base is limited and mixed. So we need to go into juvenile drug courts knowing that. Uh, but juvenile drug courts can be enormously successful. And so our job as training and technical assistance providers is to help you um, have the most successful drug court you can. Um, and for any drug courts that kind of are, are lower down on the ladder of success, my job is to help pull them up to the top of the ladder of success. All right, so let's talk about where you're at in the process of operating your court. And uh, our previous question where we talked about where you were at um, or how long you'd been in the drug court uh, and asked some of these same kinds of questions, but we want to ask it more directly. Okay, so lots of you are in currently operating courts, and this presentation actually really was designed as sort of a, a starter for folks that were kind of coming new to their drug court team. We do have a lot of turnover in, um, in juvenile justice altogether, and certainly in juvenile drug courts, so there are always new team members, and we wanted to have a way for new team members to kind of get oriented to the concept. Um, so this is, you're in the right place. And let's talk about uh, the framework of juvenile drug courts. Um, and so they come from kind of these three basic principles, the problem-solving courts, the incorporation of therapeutic jurisprudence into the court, and then being strength-based and focusing on the strengths of our young people. Um, there is a long history, going back to the start of the juvenile court itself, of courts addressing special problems with alternative approaches. Um, in the last two decades, then, that's when we've seen the rise of uh, the drug court, and then with it, problem-solving courts. I bet, you know, I, I, I know uh, one of you at least has mentioned that you work in a mental health court, veterans courts, DWI courts, um, and what, what we're seeing is that there's a recognition that some uh, challenges that bring folks to the court system require uh, more in-depth and more specialized interventions. Um, and so that's why these things happen. Uh, the theories of therapeutic jurisprudence is, um, are really one of the underpinnings of the drug court movement, and it is about the idea that courts can be therapeutic environments, um, that you don't have to be a therapist from the bench, but that you can create a therapeutic intervention that's appropriate in a court setting. Um, and again, our three-prong approach webinar talks a lot more about that. And then all drug courts, but particularly juvenile drug courts, want to focus on building assets within the clients that are in the court. Juvenile drug courts have a purpose to change behavior. It is not the purpose of the juvenile drug court to punish behavior. Punishing behavior is for those folks that come to the court once and then they go away forever. They, had a, they have an infraction, there's a response, they're held accountable, and then they go away. If you're going to have someone in your court for a year, for nine months, you can't have a punishment focus because that creates a negative interaction with that young person. So when you think about sanctioning in juvenile drug courts, think about sanctioning as a tool for behavior change, not for punishment. Um, it, it isn't um, necessarily a big shift for folks, but it's something that you kind of want to always keep in the back of your mind that that's what you're trying to accomplish. You're trying to change behavior. You're not trying to punish a behavior. And then again, you're trying to build assets. Um, the, when we first started doing this conversation, um, the strengths-based approach was really just emerging, and we talk about strengths, and folks would say, but why do I care about, you know, what's good about this young person when they're here because they did something wrong? 
And, um, and so we had to do a lot of educating. I feel like most folks that are currently working in, in the drug court field now are, are much more familiar with this. Um, and then the other thing that I want you to be thinking about is that uh, the juvenile drug court is built on a foundation in which everyone uh, engages in collaborative problem solving. Uh, you're considering the broader issues beyond the offense, and you're, you're making an effort to build on the young person's strengths and abilities. So why did we start having juvenile drug courts in the first place? Sanctioning is not the same as punishment. Yes, Mark. Well, and, and that's exactly something to be thinking about. So juvenile drug courts uh, emerged. Um, the, the first instances of juvenile drug courts occurred. Um, there's some debate about when we, we first opened our, our first juvenile drug court. Uh, but the, the most definitive answer seems to be around 1994. Um, and they did start based on the same principles as adult drug courts, that, that there are young people who have both concurrent substance abuse and delinquency who need more than they're getting either in a regular probation track or in regular treatment. So the idea behind a drug court is that a kid won't be successful on probation unless they get substance abuse treatment. But a kid maybe isn't going to be successful in substance abuse treatment unless they have some um, accountability to be attending treatment. And so it's that kind of sweet spot between um, those two things that we're talking about. And so juvenile drug courts um, are dealing with, with the same issues now that they were when they first started, uh, smoking, drinking, and other illicit drug use among um, young people is high, um, and we'd like it to be lower. Kids that um, do need treatment have a hard time getting it. Uh, their, the first adolescent substance abuse treatments were developed right around the same time as our first juvenile drug courts were opening. And so for courts that started um, back in the 90s, there wasn't actually evidence-based adolescent substance abuse treatment. So we had courts that were starting and they were using adult models and they were hoping for something that was more specific to youth, but it's, it's taken a while for the field the two fields to catch up and converge. We do now have evidence-based adolescent substance abuse treatment models that are available for treatment providers to use. Um, if you're a treatment provider uh, and you um, aren't sure if you're using one and, or you want to maybe change to a different one, um, we can talk about, you can call us up and we can talk about uh, what the research is indicating as far as what works best with this population. Um, if you're court folks and you're not sure how to talk to your treatment folks about what they're doing and how it works, we can put you in touch with some national experts in treatment and they can give you some tips about how to do that. And we also know that uh, the, the kids um, that are coming into our court come from family systems that um, have a difficult time engaging with the court system and often en engaging with the treatment system as well. Um, then we also have uh, and, and this is, I think, changing every year that we're moving toward a more coordinated approach. But there is, um, on standard probation, oftentimes uh, a, that lack of immediacy. Um, and we know that, again, with the adolescent brain, immediacy really helps with making changes. So let's again talk a little bit about what challenges you're facing working with substance abusing youth who are involved with the court. So if you can write some challenges right into the chat. Coming up with sanctions other than detention or removal from the home. Yeah, it can be really challenging to um, have a good uh, graduated sanctions plan, lack of services in very rural areas. And that um, is, is something really difficult. If you want to start a juvenile drug court in a rural area, you might not even have treatment, or treatment only comes once a month. And so figuring out how to make up for that. Involving parents and guardians, sure. Compliance with court orders coming to treatment, that's always a challenge. Um, because uh, sometimes I think treatment providers really want the court to be like a big hammer for them um, to, to get kids um, to come in and be engaged over time. Correct. Um, transportation, yes. 
Um, I don't think I've been to a juvenile drug court yet that doesn't have transportation as an issue. In rural areas, it's because services are far away from where kids live. But in urban areas, even though there's a bus system, it might take kids an hour and a half to get to services. And you can imagine once that happens, they're, they're not that excited to engage with the service. Depth of resources needing. Oh, are we keeping kids in the system too long? I think um, that's an interesting question, Paul Young. Uh, it, I think it depends on the young person. Um, what we want to target are kids that, that make sense for them um, to be in the system long enough to, to receive the services that we're offering in a drug court. Um, and so figuring out that sweet spot, though, can be really hard because we know that the longer kids are in the system, again, um, that it can really damage their outcomes. Uh, kids committing kid infractions. Yeah, once you get them in a drug court, um, it, normal adolescent behavior becomes something that you can sanction for. And so figuring out how to balance um, expectations is really difficult. Uh, recidivism and continued use is always a challenge. Oh, are we focusing unnecessarily on recreational marijuana use? Or are we folks are having parental drug use as well? And Colette's asking a question for the whole group. Do any of you put youth in the JDC for tobacco use? And Colette, I've never seen anybody use tobacco use as a reason to put folks into a juvenile drug court. Um, we're going to talk about the target population in a minute. But what we're really looking at are kids that are kind of high risk and high need. Um, and tobacco use probably isn't usually an indication of both. Kids turning 18 in the program, kids testing positive for more than one drug of choice. Yeah, so you have a number of challenges in figuring out um, kind of how to maximize your resources and get kids the services they need um, can be really, really difficult. So what is a juvenile drug court? This is, this is the definitive definition. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's really hard to, to describe it sometimes. But it's a docket within the juvenile court um, for kids with concurrent substance abuse and delinquency. You want them to have both. And you need them to need oversight. So the juvenile drug court, we offer regular review by the court, either weekly or biweekly. Um, and then there are also contacts with the caseworkers and, and other folks. And so it really is an intensive program. It's, it's, I think, even a step up from intensive probation. And so you want to be thinking about um, who, what young people really benefit from that kind of setting. And then the other thing that's kind of a, a secret sauce um, for, for all problem-solving courts is this team approach. And certainly within um, the juvenile court, uh, folks have been more willing to um, to talk across disciplines than they have been in the adult, more adversarial court. But it still is, is hard for folks to kind of um, reconcile the team approach and how to uh, work together. Oh, and there's a question in the chat about at what age are younger kids appropriate for the program? Um, and I see that some folks are going as young as 12 and some as high as 15. Um, developmentally uh, and, and depending on their um, levels of use. I would say most juvenile drug courts are taking kids that uh, the, the average age is somewhere between 14 and 17 and a half. Um, the really young kids, uh, kids that are um, probably younger than 14, um, it may not be developmentally appropriate for them to come into a juvenile drug court uh, because so many um, programs use like group therapy where um, that can be difficult for a 12-year-old to be in the same group as a 17-year-old. So that's a consideration. Um, and then again, uh, their levels of use and their reasons for use might be significantly different if they're having severe enough use at 12 um, that uh, a juvenile drug court, again, may not be the appropriate place. Um, so but I would say most juvenile drug courts, um, 14 and about 17 and a half. Uh, if you are seeing a lot of younger kids, then I think it's, it's important to think about um, who those kids are and if there are um, different places for them to get services. So what is the goal of a juvenile drug court? We want to provide immediate intervention, treatment, and structure. And uh, the really key thing here is, is immediacy. Uh, the reason why we structure juvenile drug courts for folks to come to court every week or every other week is so that there can be an immediate response to their behavior. Um, I, uh, 
I think it's hard for kids to connect the consequence if it doesn't happen within, uh, within a span of a few days um, to the behavior that you're trying to get them to change. And so um, in, in the traditional court where we maybe are scheduling um, hearings six weeks, eight weeks, months out, um, it can be really hard for, for kids to, to understand that the reason that they're getting um, you know, a, a disposition four months after their infraction. Uh, they, don't, they, they don't connect the two, and they just feel like it's something that, that's happening to them, that the court is doing to them. So our other goal, improving juveniles' level of functioning. Uh, we want young people to be sober and straight and so that they can learn the skills they need to become productive members of our society. Uh, so the nice thing about the juvenile drug court is that we monitor and we hold youth accountable. And that helps give kids a chance to become stable and to start to function in school, at home, and in their communities. Another goal, skill building. And when we think about skill building and we think about improved functioning, it's important to think about when we set goals around those things, um, how we're going to help young people achieve those goals, and then what the consequences will be when they don't achieve those goals. When we think about these things, these kids being kids, offenses that happen while they're within the drug court, um, probably be thoughtful about how you respond because you don't want to come out with your big hammers for things like maybe skipping school. Certainly not going to school is a challenge and something you want to address. It is also not necessarily something where you want to send somebody to detention for it. So always be thoughtful about how you respond to youthful behaviors. And then you want to you want to help them. Uh, this is when again we're focusing on strengths. We're helping them build skills, and we're helping them become uh, productive members of society. So uh, we want them to have skill building skills. We want them to be able to balance a checkbook. We want them to um, learn how to be responsible for themselves, to make decisions, um, to be um, uh, building healthy relationships with other healthy young people and with uh, adults, pro-social activities and the like. Uh, we want to help strengthen families. And there are a number of ways to engage with parents in the, the juvenile drug court. Um, and it is one of the most challenging aspects of the juvenile drug court. We actually have a three-part series. Um, on this uh, that we um, recorded last fall that um, I would encourage folks to take a look at um, on our website. It uh, gives you lots of ideas, practical ways to uh, engage with parents. Uh, we may offer it again, so I would say keep an eye out because it's definitely something where we want folks uh, to be focusing on. Um, I know uh, when you look at the research on treatment, the treatments that do the very best are those treatments that have a family focus. Um, and that's because, again, we return kids to a system, a uh, family system, that is strengthened and, and is better off um, than it was when they came into the, the juvenile justice system. However, family treatment models are pretty expensive. And so um, thinking about other ways to engage families in the juvenile drug court um, are appropriate. And then the last thing we're talking about here Promoting accountability. Uh, this is the public safety side of things. And you don't, no one should approach a juvenile drug court thinking that kids will not be held accountable. They're coming to court every week. They're being drug tested two to three times a week. They're talking to their probation officers or caseworkers on the regular. So they're held accountable. It's that they're not necessarily punished, as, as Mark mentioned earlier. And that's the, the distinction. Um, and so thinking about, though, um, holding youth accountable, thinking about how they can use, um, you can use restorative justice practices to help them make their communities whole and, and pay back some of the harm that they've done to their family system, to their community, to their school. Um, that's all part of what we really want um, when we're thinking about our most lofty and high-minded juvenile drug court goals. That's what we'd like. All right, and I'm going to pause here and take a look at some of the things coming in on the chat. Um, so Paul Young, you say, what if a kid is already functioning at a high level? Um, well, if you already have a kid who's functioning at a high level, that might mean that they don't have a high enough need 
for your services and might not be appropriate. So if you have a lot of kids in your juvenile drug court that are kind of um, functioning at that level, I would say you'd want to think about your target population and whether or not you're getting the kids that really benefit from the services you have. <laughs> oh no, and, and then uh, Victoria says they offer gift cards as incentives for better grades, but no one was able to earn them. And, and uh, education and having educational goals I think is really important. Uh, the important thing to remember in the drug court is that we want to have those goals. It's just really hard to think about holding youth accountable for those things when those aren't the reasons they came to court in the first place. So we want to sanction for things that are, are conditions of probation. Um, and then we want to be thoughtful about how we respond. Um, and uh, we do have, um, again, in our three-prong approach, we do have some ideas about how to really um, motivate kids to do that. And it, it is hard when kids just don't care about school. All right, and then we have a question, how do you sanction a juvenile who's been to an inpatient treatment facility and is still using? Well, that's really hard. I think um, that's a really big question you need to talk with your treatment folks about, about why that young person is still using, um, whether or not it was the appropriate inpatient facility. Um, I think you also need to talk to the young person. I, I think uh, one of the things that we sometimes forget about within our programs is, is that um, kids should have a voice in the process. And so talking to them about um, why they're still using and then also talking to them about what they think is an appropriate sanction for continued use is, I, is really the way to go. I know that one of the responses that I've seen courts have when they get worried about kids and safety and overdoses is to put kids into detention for their own good, you know, to keep them safe from their use. Uh, and I understand that it's scary for grown-ups um, when kids are, are in that position. Uh, but it's important for us to think about what resources we also have within our communities to avoid doing that uh, and also to be thinking about if those resources don't exist, how we can help create them. Um, and that goes into Rosanna's question about at what point do you consider terminating. Um, I think it's really important for courts to actually think about terminating probably sooner than they do. Um, most juvenile drug courts, they'll, they'll let a kid fail a number of times before they have the termination conversation. And it's because of this. You want to help them, and you recognize that they have high needs and that they're at risk. And so you try a lot of different things. Um, what I would suggest is that you start to do kind of um, case file reviews at regular points when a young person is within the program. And so at three months, at six months, and at a year, you do a kind of a case file review where you talk about the young person's progress to that point and talk about how likely it is that they will be able to complete the program. Um, you'll want to make sure that your folks from treatment are in the room for that conversation. They can talk about treatment progress. And certainly I would say that you should be doing um, frequent assessments if you can, if you can afford to. Um, doing a reassessment at six months to say, have we had any impact on their use and on their, um, on their functioning? That kind of information will give you a more objective picture of where the young person is at, and it will make it easier to make a decision about termination. All right, then Colette asked a question, and she's getting some good answers. Good. All right, so I'm going to move on then, and we can come back to some of these. And again, this is um, just our really introductory, what is a juvenile drug court? We're going to have a series of webinars all through the year that will answer some of these questions more in depth. So when juvenile drug court started, uh, there, there was no clear idea of what a juvenile drug court looked like. So in about the year 2000, the um, Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention asked um, the National Drug Court Institute and the National Council to get together um, a series of practitioners um, and, and ask them kind of how they were doing business. And out of that came the 16 strategies. And this has been the basis of the juvenile drug courts um, up to this point. And you, you can download this. Uh, it um, really gives us 16 different areas that we want to focus on um, in juvenile drug courts. The 16 strategies are based on the 10 key components. So if you are familiar with the 10 key components from the adult world, the 16 strategies, very similar. We just added some kid-specific items. Kid-specific items like 
our focus on strengths, but also family engagement, educational linkages, um, and developmentally appropriate services. And if 16 strategies is too many for you, and it's a lot, um, then you can boil it down into these um, five core concepts. So we want to have a structure. So that's the team approach. That's having all of, um, all of the right players around the table. That's having um, uh, a policy procedure manual and a, and, a, and a participant handbook. That's all of the structure um, that you need to have a juvenile drug court. And then we're, we have um, program and treatment design. And this is about case management and having kids um, in the right program and getting the right services. Target population, it's about having the right kid. Um, if we don't have the right kids for our services, then they're not going to be successful. Monitoring and evaluation is uh, key to making sure that you're getting the outcomes that you want. Um, when I was talking about that mini case file review, that's about monitoring and evaluation. That's about always taking a step back and looking at your program and saying, are we doing what we said we would do? It's not always about hiring an evaluator who comes in and, and collects reams of data and then spits something back out to tell you what you're doing. It's about your program and your team saying, are we doing what we said we would do? And then finally, incentives and sanctions. And we do break out incentives and sanctions in juvenile drug courts because this is kind of one of those cornerstones of behavior change. We use the carrot and the stick to help get kids to, to change their behavior. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the challenges in drug courts. And um, I have just a couple of agree and disagree polls for you. So agree or disagree, parents are an obstacle for success for people in the court. All right, and it seems like the poll's coming up with a lot of folks that are agreeing that parents can be an obstacle, and some folks are disagreeing. And I bet, yep, Pauline, you, I was going to say you did exactly what I was going to say. As I said, I bet some people said sometimes or maybe. Yeah, there's, there's no definitive absolute for this question. Um, I, would say, I always say it's the rule of threes. About a third of your parents are going to engage basically immediately. Right? They're going to say, oh my gosh, I can't believe my kid has this problem, and what can I do to help, help her get better? And then a third are going to be reluctant, but will eventually engage with the court. And that last third might never engage with the court. The real challenge is, is that we don't know which, one, which category a family falls into when we first meet them. And so uh, we, the engagement strategies really need to be very broad. All right, we have another question. All right, so does every community need a juvenile drug court? All right, and we're split pretty evenly between agree and disagree. A few more disagree and don't feel like every community needs to have a juvenile drug court. Uh, the thing to think about here um, is, that, is you know, really about do you have enough kids that need this kind of level of service? There's always a question of access for um, kids. So if kids are in um, a more rural more, or maybe a more poverty-stricken area, um, they might not have access to the same things as folks from uh, a more affluent or, m or more urban area, which means that sometimes our kids in poor rural areas don't get access to a juvenile drug court simply because it's too difficult for a juvenile drug court to exist there. And uh, so the idea of access is one to think about when we think about whether or not every community should have one. Every community should have the opportunity to have a juvenile drug court and then be able to make the determination based on their, their population whether or not it's appropriate. We're not there yet. We have many communities where having a juvenile drug court is a struggle because there aren't services. Um, but we definitely want to make sure that, that there's equity for kids no matter where they live. All right, and our last agree or disagree question. Some drug problems are not serious enough for admission to a juvenile drug court.
Yeah, we're getting a lot of agrees here. Um, the, the reason why it's important to think about juvenile drug courts as a partnership between the court and substance abuse treatment is that um, as court folks, you shouldn't have to know um, whether or not the drug problem is serious enough. You may feel like it is, but the great thing is is that the folks over on the treatment side have tools, screening and assessment tools, that help them determine kind of what the level of care is. And so you can have some kind of objectivity about whether or not a kid is right for the program. Uh, now we're arguing semantics. If we call it a problem, then they qualify. Sure, um, but I think that there are ways to know that without, um, without having to use um, any subjective criteria. All right, so I want to go back again to our core concepts um, and let you know that today we're going to be talking more in depth about two of these, which are structure and target population. Um, the other three will be covered during other webinars as we, we go along here. So I want to talk about structure because this is one of the ways in which juvenile drug courts differ pretty um, sharply from regular juvenile court. Juvenile drug courts are a team approach. And so what we ask courts to do um, when they start is to really think about, do they need a drug court? And so uh, I think that courts that have been existing should also do this. This is a thing that I think you should do every couple of years this comprehensive planning and revising. I have heard um, and I've seen statistically uh, that juvenile court or yeah, juvenile court participation is down across the board, right? Have all of you noticed that too, that you have less kids coming into the system, um, crime is down. So where 10 years ago there might have been a juvenile drug court that had 20 participants, a lot of those courts are now seeing that they have 12 or, or maybe even only 10 participants. And so going back to and saying, do we still need this court? Is this court still appropriate um, within our system is really a good idea. Uh, for those systems that are using something like Reclaiming Futures, which is really about infusing many of these concepts into the juvenile justice system altogether, it may turn out that the special docket isn't necessary anymore because there's a much better um, continuum of care and services for those young people and that their intensive juvenile probation folks are really able to provide the same kinds of um, interventions that the drug court does. Um, I know in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, they have a substance abuse unit which are probation officers that are trained in motivational interviewing that partner with a substance abuse treatment provider and they handle all of that within that unit. So all of the kids that would have been in a drug court instead are assigned to this unit. So thinking about what resources you have and what um, may have changed in your community uh, is really important when you think about where your drug court fits. And I would suggest to all of you, um, even if you're kind of the low man on the totem pole on your team, to be thinking about this and coming back um, and, and talking with folks. And Colette has raised her hand. Colette, do you have a question? You don't have your phone number next to your name. Do you? No, so I can't unmute your phone. Um, can you type your question into chat if you have one? Okay, so in um, Pennsylvania, it's Allegheny County, so that's Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, so it's, it's a re reasonably large jurisdiction. Um, I believe they have five JPOs in the unit, um, and I think three counselors that they work with. Um, don't quote me on that, though. Uh, and we're actually at the National Council. We're going to go and, and take a look at it um, this, this spring because we want to know more about it because we think it could be something that would be useful to other folks. So if you're interested, kind of um, make a note to uh, contact me again in a couple of months and I'll have more information about how their program operates.
All right, so I want to talk about the team and who's on the team. Um, and I'm going to really briefly describe all of these roles because this, I think, um, if you're a new person coming into the juvenile drug court, can sometimes be the most confusing thing. So on the team, we have the drug court coordinator. And the coordinator wears a lot of hats. Um, he or she oversees the activities of the team, conducts quality assurance of each team member, maintains client data, remains informed regarding budgetary concerns, and coordinates services from all of the different folks around the table and then community providers as well. The prosecutor um, often serves as the gatekeeper um, and selects the youth who will be referred to the drug court program. They obtain prior criminal histories, they participate in team meetings, and attend non-adversarial court proceedings. And in juvenile drug courts, we do want to have non-adversarial court proceedings. Anything that's going to happen adversarially should happen during the staffing, not during the court. And if we're going to have a prosecutor at the table, we definitely want a, a defense attorney. So the defense attorney is a juvenile drug court uh, defense attorney who um, really they inform the JDC participant about the rigors of the juvenile drug court. Um, and so I don't want them to sell <laughs> the court to them. I think they need to be realistic with their clients about what's expected. But uh, also for defense attorneys, if you're thinking about what's in the best inter interest of the child, you know, helping them get, get clean and sober is a very good thing. So thinking about how you can help your clients um, attend and, and feel good about it is an important part of that job. Uh, you're going to also preserve all legal rights of the client. Advocate for fair and equal treatment of the client, that's especially during staffing. That's one of the things that um, you don't do quite the same level of zealous defense that you do um, you know, in, in the courtroom itself, but it's still a, a big piece of the job. And then again, participate in team meetings and attend all non-adversarial court proceedings. The treatment provider um, is, and the treatment representative is, is the person who comes to drug court um, from the treatment provider to talk about uh, rehabilitative therapy sessions, um, any drug screening, case management and monitoring um, of the JDC participants um, and, and really educating the team about treatment. Uh, it, it can be hard for courts to have every single counselor who works with the kids come to court. And so oftentimes the treatment representative has to gather all of that information and bring it to the table. Um, we love it when school is at the table because uh, we know when school is at the table, kids are more likely to be engaged in school services. Um, and I know that the schools are a challenge. We actually have a whole publication about it um, on our website, and I encourage folks to download it for ideas about how to work with the school. Then we also have probation officers um, or community supervision officers. And uh, probation is really the, the folks who have the biggest contact with the young people. Um, they do active monitoring of the drug court participants and they conduct home visits, school visits. They spend a lot of time with the young people. And they are the experts, really, on these kids and what they need and what challenges they face. And so um, they, they are a really valuable team member. And then, of course, the judge. And the judge serves a, a number of roles. They are, um, of course, the judicial officer. And in some courts, the judge is the coach. And so the team makes recommendations, but the judge makes the final decision. And in some courts, the judge is a team member. And so they, the team votes, or they come to consensus, and the judge abides by that. Uh, the judge is the face of the team in the courtroom, and uh, oftentimes the, the face of the team also out in the community. So I want to ask the question, what challenges are you experiencing with your team? Um, and I'd like you to write down some of your ideas in chat. And Mark, I like that as a team member, um, I, I'm guessing you're a defense attorney, um, that you don't represent the individual participants. And that's a great way to do it if you can make that work out. That way you don't have any particular dog in the fight. All right, so these are some team challenges you are experiencing. Contact with clients often take place in different capacities, absolutely, and it's not always shared across team roles how that contact worked. 
one person trying to dominate the conversation. Pauline, you've been to a lot of trainings. You know about storming. Teams go through phases, um, norming, storming, forming, and performing. Overzealous public defender, adversarial hearings. And I think it's really important um, to remember that it's, it's hard sometimes, especially if you are a public defender or a prosecutor, coming onto the drug court team and really thinking about how you have to change your role and your point of view. Um, and so um, figuring out how to help those folks kind of buy into the team process uh, can be very helpful. Yeah, and team members understanding roles. This is the biggest challenge we see um, in the longevity and sustainability of our courts is that uh, it's really, really easy for courts to drift away from their original missions as soon as we add in some new team members who don't always buy in. Um, don't always agree on sanctions. Yeah, it, it can sometimes be a big argument in the team about how to have an approach. Um, and again, uh, some of our tools are really designed to help mitigate that, to help you have a plan so that you don't have to have a debate about what the sanction's going to be. It's really clear that, oh, this happened, so now this has to happen. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we've been trying to help um, teams with. Battling negativity, yep. Oh, confidentiality. We have a whole presentation on confidentiality also as part of our series of webinars. Um, so, so Terry, you should definitely come back to that. Um, it is really easy to have those kind of hallway conversations about the youth in the drug courts. And I've seen so many times in small towns how you just kind of know all the things about all the folks um, I come from a small town, um, and when I go home, one of the things that my mom always tells me about are all of the people that are in drug court now. And, and they only have an adult drug court because they don't, they don't have a youth drug court. But even if we try to keep the proceedings kind of confidential, everybody sort of finds out anyway. So thinking about how to keep things confidential is really a challenge. Yeah, how do you run a staffing so that you don't spend um, three hours staffing but still feel like you have enough time to talk about cases. Kathy, that's definitely a challenge that folks have. Um, or that they're too short. Tim, I've never seen a team have too short of a staffing. Usually they go on for a whole day and I feel like I need to bring a lunch. So I want to come see your court and how you're <laughs> operating. Um, we, we will be doing um, a webinar in the fall on staffing and how to, how to run a good case staffing. Agreeing on things, being more creative. Oh, well, wow. you guys have a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, so these are definitely challenges that, um, that all courts are facing. Um, and there are, uh, one of the things I always encourage folks to do is if you are experiencing challenges as a team, to, to spend some time um, just addressing them. Um, too often we get really caught up in the day-to-day -day work and having staffing and then having courts and getting kids to appointments and making sure that we have all of the, the ducks lined up and getting incentives, that we don't talk enough about the health of our program. And so we do encourage drug court teams to do that regularly. I'm skipping that question because we're getting low on time. Um, and I want to talk about target population. So when we think about juvenile drug courts, where do they fit? And again, this is one of those times when we have um, some research, but we don't have, I don't, I don't have a definitive take substance abusing youth who are between the ages of 13 and 17 and a half, who on a structured decision making tool score in the moderate range while also having uh, you know, high needs in the areas of X, Y, and Z. We're not quite there, but I can tell you some general things. We do think that kids that are moderate to high risk, both in their criminogenic and substance abuse um, careers, are the appropriate kids. So you can see here sort of different things that happen in the juvenile justice system. Over on um, low risk um, and low need, that's kind of the bottom left quadrant, there's those non-compliance calendars, prevention services, um, and abstinence is a proximal goal that can be reached. Um, and above that, when we have um, they don't have a high substance abuse treatment need, but they have a lot of criminogenic risk, then that's, um, you know, we do some pro-social rehabilitation um, activities. We have abstinence and compliance and restrictive consequences. And this is kind of classic probation. Um, and then over um, in the quadrant across from that, uh, for, for kids that have high risk and high need, 
There's the status calendars, intensive treatment, compliance consequences, positive reinforcement. And then underneath that, for kids who just have a high treatment need but not a risk of delinquency, then that's intensive treatment and positive reinforcement. So where do our juvenile drug courts fit then if we're thinking about this? They fit kind of right here. If we think about them on the continuum, both of substance abuse need and criminogenic risk, I would say our juvenile drug court kids are probably the six, sevens, and eights. So you can't quite take maybe the nines and tens because they might need stuff that, you know, really highly specialized. And also there aren't enough kids that are going to score a nine or a ten to make it make sense to have an entire docket. You don't want to take kids that are much lower than sixes on the criminogenic risk need and the substance abuse treatment need because they're not going to be, uh, they don't need as much as what you're offering. And so then you're kind of widening the net a little bit. So you're really thinking about that kind of that sweet spot. Um, and, uh, and there are lots of ways to get there, but that's really who we think is the appropriate target population. Um, so there are the, the three keys to success. We want to match the right use to the right program at the right time. So the right use is based on static risk, dynamic risk, and then their, uh, their openness and their willingness for, to go to treatment. And we find these things out using structured decision-making tools. We want you to be using risk-need tools um, with kids um, for the legal screening. And then for the clinical screening, because I think you need to do both a legal screening and a clinical screening, we want you to be using appropriate tools for clinical screening as well. And then once you've screened, then you'd need to assess. And then you need to match them to the right program. And that's an evidence-based program where you're matching individual needs and you're implementing it with integrity. So this is your drug court where you're using evidence-based services. You've got evidence-based treatment. Um, you're using therapeutic jurisprudence principles within the courtroom. And then you really are individualizing the approach. Um, and then at the right time. Um, so sometimes uh, they, it's not the right time because uh, the youth is 17 and a half and they're going to turn 18, so they can't come into your program. Um, or sometimes it's that their level of care is too high. So a young person, what you have in your drug court is intensive outpatient treatment, but the young person really needs inpatient treatment. So that's not the right time for that young person to come into your drug court. They need to go to inpatient treatment, assuming you have it available. So it's that kind of matching that we're talking about. So let's talk about, more specifically, the eligibility criteria. So the right kid, you want to know the age range, the chronological history, probation history, a risk level, and a need level. You want to have all of that. That's, that's objective criteria and information you can get. And what do we mean by the right time? Um, the, the program length is appropriate. Again, I think your terms of probation should match. So if a young person is only on probation for six months, and you know that it takes nine months to graduate from your drug court, that's not a good match because that's not the right time for the kid. A drug use history. Many drug courts um, require young people to have had um, an instance of treatment before they come into the drug court because they want to make sure that these are kids that have tried other things and have not been successful in other places. And of course, recent drug use. And then what do we mean by the right program? Well, what services do you have available? Um, I, I tell you to target those six, sevens, and eights, but if you don't have intensive outpatient treatment, that's not going to really work for you. So you have to think about what services you have, what treatment options you have, um, and what level of care and what supervision level they need. So all of these things need to all match up to make sure that you're getting the right kid for your drug court. Oh, Amanda, what about the juvenile that fits the criteria but the parents do not? So there is much debate and little evidence about how to uh, appropriately um, involve parents in drug courts. We know that programs that involve parents for, with kids do better. Drug courts sometimes ask parents to attend court. That's not always appropriate. Sometimes drug courts instead say, do you have any other responsible adult in your life that will come to court with you? And so what they find um, in those cases, if the young person is right for the program but the parents are not, then they, get, they try to find some surrogate adult that would serve the role that the parents would. Um, 
but if the if your program is using something like functional family therapy, which is a family-based treatment that happens in the home, if the parents refuse, then you really can't take that kid into your program. And it's kind of heartbreaking when that happens. But it, it really you really do have to think about your requirements and, and how it matches and whether or not um, you uh, are comfortable doing that. And backing up to Pauline's question, do other jurisdictions utilize a validated assessment to determine which use are accepted? Yes. Um, so ideally, Pauline, what I'd love to see happen everywhere is that we have um, kids get screened. Um, based on the screening, it's indicated that there, there should be an assessment, and they get referred for the assessment. Then the assessment happens, and once the assessment is done, the referral to drug court is made based on information from the assessment. That would be the ideal plan there. But because it's hard to pay for an assessment without a disposition, what mostly happens is that kids get screened and then get provisionally referred to the drug court um, as a disposition so that they can pay for the assessment. Most of the time, the assessment comes back in a way that the drug court is still appropriate. If it doesn't, then I always think teens need to have kind of an escape hatch for those situations so that kids can be let out of the drug court because they're not an appropriate candidate. But absolutely, we would want everyone to be using validated screening and assessment tools. That gives you ob objective criteria, again, for who comes into your program. All right, and Samantha's asking, what assessment tools do you use? So if folks want to chime in about what they're using, um, so Mark, there's, there's no tool to assess parental appropriateness. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's based on kind of how, how willing they are to participate um, and uh, join into to the services. If you ask um, a parent to uh, attend court every week and they absolutely can't um, or won't, then that then you have to think about, is that the right kid to come to the program? Is there a way to get around that? You um, know, all of those things. So back to the question of uh, the assessment tools. Um, we've got Gabrielle is using the GAIN. Um, I know for risk um, and need on the legal side, we have lots of folks that are using the PACT now, um, the PACT. Uh, the, the SASE is a screening tool that lots of folks use. Um, the MAZI is an assessment tool that, that is quite good. Yeah, there you go. Kathy's got a whole list. All right, Jeff says, based on your answer to parent involvement, is it improper to order kids to participate? No, I think your, your program should decide what level of parent involvement you need. I have seen drug courts operate almost without parent involvement at all. Um, and kids come to, pro, come to the program and they, they do well. Um, if you have parent requirements, you should be thoughtful about what the parent requirements are and um, how likely it is that they're able to meet those requirements. So I always say it's, it's you start out with um, kind of a baseline of parental involvement. And maybe it's that the parents participate in a monthly call with somebody from the drug court team. Or maybe it is that they come every week to court. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe it's, it's that you um, individualize it and work out a plan with every parent. And so you, you sit down with them and you say, your kid's in the drug court. We really want to work with you. What can you do? Can you, can you come with us? Can you come to court every week? Can you, can you do a call with uh, the caseworker? Can we stop by and chat with you at your house? You know, asking those questions of parents and figuring out where they're at for participation. Um, I do have courts that say parent involvement is, is non-negotiable, and if a, if a parent can't participate and we can't find another adult, then we can't take that young person. So, so it's, it's that sort of whatever your team decides um, is, is how you do it. And, and Dr. Warren, you're thinking that parents should be ordered to court for teens with high drug use. Yeah, some people really feel like if parents had done a better job parenting, then you wouldn't have kids in this situation. Um, uh, and, and sometimes there is an abuse or neglect kind of um, petition that's filed um, on parents in drug courts. That doesn't happen very often, though, um, because uh, I think, again, if you're trying to, to create a relationship with them where you're working toward the same goals, you want to approach it as non-adversarially as possible. 
I've never heard of the Patty Pauline. Um, one of our, uh, the webinar we'll be doing in March is actually more in depth about this um, approach, this uh, Right Kid, Right Time, Right Program approach. And we'll talk more about how scores on our screening and assessment tools can help us uh, make decisions about who the right kids are for the program. Um, we always want you to take a, take a broad view and a long view of your program. And so we always say good, better, and best. So when you think about your target population and your criteria, um, I want you to, to take a look at it and decide if you fall into the good, better, or best category. And I am always encourage teams, if you're, if you're good, then I want you to try to move to better. And if you're best, then try to think about what's exceptional. Oh, and um, Ello Collette couldn't register for the next webinar, so you'll have to help her out with that. All right, so our last question, and we're, we're almost done, is uh, I want to end on a positive note. So what are the payoffs for families and um, organi organizations, community uh, partners? Um, what payoff will they get if they kind of participate with you in the juvenile drug court? Better communication. Yeah, for parents especially, I think sometimes they can, um, they really see a change in their, their young person and they feel like they um, have much better communication with them and they function better as a family. Time together. Uh, I've seen lots of um, courts offer, as part of their family engagement, kind of optional family activities that they can come to, like a family game night uh, where they also offer food. and. Um, and it's one of those things that I think persistence really is key. Um, I know the Snohomish um, Washington team, kind of their first game night didn't have great attendance, um, but the couple of families that were there talked to the other families and said, hey, it was really fun, and they fed us. And so they got better and better attendance as, as they went along. Um, and so thinking about those things. And awareness that there are programs available to address issues. Yes, I think communities recognize that there are challenges for kids in their communities, and they don't always know that there are um, services and, um, and programs available to help address them. Yeah, I think uh, the parents really want to to function well. Even parents who have their own substance abuse problems, their own mental health issues, lots of other issues going on, most of the time those parents still love their kids. They're just not necessarily, they don't have as many tools or they're overwhelmed by their circumstances. And so thinking about how we can help them uh, and make it uh, an increased uh, value add for their family is important. Increased level, um, increased functioning for, for kids. So yeah, when we have kids that, that are going to go out and get part-time jobs and, and be part of their community, that benefits the community, that benefits their families. And so um, the, it all is a, a ripple effect. Yes, and, and Amanda, I think um, you have hit on something really important with your comments because um, even if you improve functioning while they're in the court, that's still a success even if it doesn't have a long-term consequence. And one of the things that we struggle with in drug courts is figuring out how to really define success. Because sometimes our kids are not going to be sober, straight adults for the rest of their lives. And sometimes that's totally appropriate. Sometimes it, it ends up being a lifelong challenge for them. And so thinking about what we mean by success and how um, to talk about success with the families and with the community is really important. And so. Uh, and then, of course, you want the success to be sustained, but that, that's not on you. That's on the young person themselves to sustain that. Okay, we've got a couple of more comments, and then we're going to just wrap up. Um, do the evidence-based studies follow the juveniles for a long period of time? No. <laughs> this is one of the problems we have with getting good outcome data for kids um, and, and in the drug courts is we don't really get a lengthy outcome study. Uh, what we do know is that delinquency is, um, is something that desists over time. 
most um, most crime is committed by younger people. Yeah, um, not just kids, not just you know under 18, but uh, under 25. O after 25, then the incidence of, of crime rates really uh, desists over time, and it really does become those folks that have been habitualized and chronic um, criminals at that point. Um, but what we do know about substance abuse is that it is something, it's a disease that has an early, um, an early adolescent onset. So the earlier the younger kids start using, the more likely they are that they will continue to use throughout their lives, and that they'll have periods of treatment, sobriety, new use, treatment, sobriety, new use. Um, and so what we also know is that the earlier we can intervene in that cycle, the, the better off we are for having a, a long-term impact. So if we can intervene with a young person who starts using when they're 12 and we intervene with them at, at 15, then maybe that means that their cycle of use, sobriety, use, sobriety, can end at 35 when they're uh, with sobriety rather than waiting until they're 55 for it to end with sobriety. So it's that sort of thing where we know earlier intervention is better. Um, so do we not know if the evidence-based programs really work or change behaviors? We do, um, Colette, know to some extent. Again, there's, there's research. Our pool of research for juvenile programs altogether is much um, shallower than the pool of research for adult programs. So we have evidence about like substance abuse treatments that work well with kids. Um, that's um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. That's the Seven Challenges program. That's stuff like functional family therapy and multi-systemic family therapy. Um, that's ACRA, which is um, assertive community reinforcement approach. So those things we know have evidence that support that they work well with kids. It doesn't have, most of those studies didn't have a long-term outcome component to them where they followed young people into adulthood. Getting um, kids to respond uh, to follow-ups after they turn 18 is really tricky because of um, juvenile records and how juvenile laws are sealed. And so sometimes our evidence is based on kind of this general knowledge about uh, when crime and, um, and substance use desist. So uh, I wouldn't say that we don't know anything that works, um, but that I would say that there are still a lot of questions and there's no, there's no silver bullets. There's no do this this way every time and you will always have good outcomes. Um, and, and we're still waiting to get to that level. Uh, there are, um, the Reclaiming Futures Project actually is doing a great webinar on responsible practice um, in a few weeks that we'll send out to all of you that really is talking about um, how to be adolescent focused and uh, to um, be appropriate in working with young people. So Mark, for your question, I am our presenter, Jessica Pierce. I work at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. And that's my phone number and that's my email. Email is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, and we have a whole team of folks that work on the juvenile drug courts. And so if you guys want more services, um, more information, more webinars, if you have a topic that you want to have a webinar on, send me an email and I'll put it together. Um, and uh, again, if you want a training, if you want to have somebody come out and look at your court and give you some feedback about how you're operating, all of that is within your grasp. You can just call us. You're on our list because you received this. Uh, you received the email um, notification that told you we were doing this webinar, which means that we got your contact information somewhere. So I would encourage everyone to follow up with us. Um, the three-prong approach webinar hasn't been actually officially announced yet, so you guys are the first to hear about it. Um, we are really excited to to be providing this series to all of you, and I uh, hope you can join us for all of them. Um, Ello has put in some information about our, our information center there. Uh, that also has our contact information and is a place where you can download the forms for more training um, and more technical assistance. The last thing we're going to do um, when I end this webinar, you're going to get our evaluation and it's going to pop up in the window. So I just ask everybody to take the two minutes it takes to respond to the evaluation about um, today's webinar and how you liked the material. All right, thank you all for attending and we'll see you next week.